What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Shadow Gambit, The Cursed Crew, a stealth strategy game from Mimimi Me, Me, Me Games, the people behind another popular stealth strategy game, Desperados 3, just to include one of them, as they've done several of these. But before we dive into that, to get my usual stuff out of the way, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. If you're curious about everything that I cover, there's a video linked in the description below that will cover it, and my Steam profile is public and linked below as well. Last but not least, I did receive a review copy for this game, however, the timing was a little rough, so this video is coming out a few days after the official release, though do be aware I was given a review copy here. As I mentioned though, this game is a stealth strategy title, so what that actually entails is that we take control of a crew of ghost pirates in a version of the Caribbean, where we face off against an inquisition who is opposed to our very existence, and we are fighting them to find a pirate's treasure, of course, though the story does evolve into a bit more than that. Along the way, we'll be picking up various crew members with all types of different skills that allow us to approach the mission-based structure of this game in a variety of very open ways that make it a bit like a sandbox almost. Now, before we jump into the story of this one, a note on the difficulty. There are a few different difficulties here, but but all of them are on a per mission basis. While you will pick a difficulty at the beginning of the game, when you're setting up to go on a mission, you can freely change this as it is a per mission difficulty system. However, while pirate is the base difficulty, going up or down to something like explorer or legend or cursed affects both your pirate's health as well as the reaction time of enemies. So on higher difficulties, enemies will notice you faster and thus trigger the alarm and things like that, on top of the fact that you are easier to kill. On the lowest difficulty, you've got about five hits before you die, whereas it only gets lower from there, down to where basically any hit will kill you. I will say though, on the subject of difficulty, Explorer and Pirate are very similar. I think the main difference there is you have a little more health, but reaction time-wise, etc., normal felt basically like like Explorer to me. And while going up from there definitely felt more difficult as enemies start reacting to you very, very quickly, and you barely have any health, the bottom two difficulties felt nearly identical. From there though, let's talk a little bit about the story of this game. One of our pirates available to us acts as the sort of main character, Afia Manicato, and she joins up with the crew of the Red Marley after saving the ship, the Red Marley, from the Inquisition, who is trying to trap it for some reason. The Red Marley isn't just any old regular ghost ship, though. It has the power to manipulate time via its memories. It can capture memories of a situation and then unleash them, which effectively rewinds time back to when that memory was captured. Now, in-game, this is basically just a quick save function. However, they've tied it into the narrative. The Red Marley, in addition to being captured by the Inquisition, recently lost her captain, Black Eye Mordecai, who hid his treasure that the Marley is now trying to recover. So we're going to help the ghost ship with this while at the same time recovering the crew members that were also lost when the ship was captured. Over the course of the game, you'll be reviving several of them as you seek to fight off the Inquisition. Now for a story setup that will basically cover your bases, I will say the story gets a little more interesting than that, but it's probably not going to blow you away or anything. There are one or two twists that you can pretty much see coming, but overall I would say it's decent given that the game's focus, however, is on stealth strategy. I don't think that's a really big deal. Now from there, let's talk progression systems, of which there are a few, but they're all relatively simple. It basically comes down to unlocking characters, unlocking the extra power for those characters, and then completing the logbook challenges. So as we complete the story missions of the game, we'll be gathering black pearls and soul energy, which will allow us to revive new characters. You can pick the ones you want to revive as you go, so you can unlock the ones that are most interesting to you. Each of those characters has a set of varying abilities that make them useful in one mission versus another, that kind of thing. However, beyond just their active abilities that they'll be using to take out enemies or potentially hide or set up the battlefield type stuff, 
Certain individual characters can also swim or not swim or have the ability to climb up vine walls or not, which are some things to keep in mind when you're choosing which people to revive when, but you will eventually be able to revive everyone. Now, each of these characters has an extra power that they can unlock by gaining vigor. As you complete various missions, you will fill a vigor bar, and every time that fills up, you can unlock an upgrade. This effectively gives a massive boost to one of your character's abilities. To give an example of my favorite one, our sort of half-plant pirate, Sulady, has an ability that will throw dust at a guard and force it to walk in the opposite direction away from you. However, her upgrade gives you a choice to instead make that guard walk towards you, which makes taking them out really, really easy while also removing them potentially from another guard's sightline. And all of the other characters also have upgrades like that that can generally be pretty useful. Now, the last part of progression is the logbook. You see, after the story of the game is over, you can keep playing in a much more free-form fashion. The story of the game is relatively linear, and it's going to take you across most of the missions and the islands, as each island effectively serves as a hub for the missions. Afterwards, however, the game will, through the logbook, tell you everything that you might have missed, and this will include a variety of badges and challenges and stuff for you to check out that will initially be hidden from you, but upon story completion is thus revealed and allows you to track down exactly what you're after and take on these challenges, which provides you some goals while also giving you some more game time and exploring what is possible. However, in addition to just completing challenges, once you reach 85% completion, you can actually unlock a secret character who can on the fly take on the abilities of any other character that you have, which is needless to say very, very strong. Though I will say by the time you get this character, you've effectively done everything. And thus their usefulness is up for debate. Now another part of the logbook is the crew tales and challenges. The logbook itself is divided up into the islands themselves and their challenges alongside your crew and what you've done with them. Your crew members each have a crew tale, which is effectively a side quest of sorts for them that can kind of explore their character and personality a little bit, and each of them are fairly interesting. Each of them, once you reach a certain point in the story, however, also has a challenge available. This is a set mission that has to be done with that character, sometimes solo, sometimes with a group, while also feeding into their backstory a little bit, which I thought was kind of cool. So as you can see, the progression systems are very simple but decently rewarding. Now the next portion of this video is a few things lumped all together via the stealth, combat, and gameplay. A lot of that is sort of linked together so it's easier to talk about it all at once rather than separate this into parts. So as I mentioned, this game is mission-based. The Red Marley serves as our hub out on the sea, and this is where we'll do things like perform our crew tales, talk to members if you want more of their story, that kind of thing, but it's also where we will select our missions. From the mission select screen, we can pick the islands that are available to us, see what missions are available, select the difficulty for that mission, alongside the characters we would like to take on that mission. The missions themselves are usually three-man missions, that is to say you'll take three of your crew with you, though some of these are a little bit different. There's a few that only have one person allowed, there's a couple later in the game that have all of them available, but most of them you'll be taking three of your crew members along. Once we actually start a mission, you'll be able to pick a landing spot. The first couple of missions this is somewhat set in stone, as there's only one available, but later on you'll be able to pick from a few different landing spots to start the mission from, which can each come with their own benefits or detriments depending on guard positioning, that kind of thing. Now let's talk about the battlefield setup, so to speak. One of the things I didn't care for about this game is that, depending on the mission you choose, it can be either night or day on the island. This affects a few things like how easily guards can see you, how easily they can discover bodies, that kind of thing. So at night it's easier to hide, at daytime it's more difficult. Pretty basic. However, in each of those instances, the layout and setup of the guards is exactly the same. So this means where you're going to the same island for a different mission, the layout of the guards, no matter what mission you chose or are trying to do, will be the same. Which I think coupled with the problem that there's not a lot of enemy variety within the first couple of missions, you'll have seen all of the enemies that are available, can make winding through some of these missions a little tiresome, because ultimately once you figure figured out how to dismantle defenses in a certain area, that's pretty much it. You figured it out. Every other mission on this island is going to have that exact same layout, which I thought was honestly a little disappointing. 
That said, in order to take those enemies out, we have to employ our characters and their powers appropriately. Pretty much every character has a melee attack that can either knock a guard out or just kill them outright, and then you'll have to hide the body, potentially, via a skill or by dragging it to a hiding place. You can use a highlight toggle to show you all of the places you can hide, which is typically places like bushes or just in the dark, and you can utilize these places of cover to hide from guards as you try to dismantle their defenses. You can click on guards to see their vision cones. The part of their cone with stripes in it, so to speak, is an area that as long as you're crouched, the guard won't actually see you. The vision cone that is full green, if you step into that, you'll start triggering the guard's reaction time. That cone will start to fill up with yellow, and if the yellow reaches where you are in the cone, you are officially recognized, and a local alarm goes off where the nearby enemies will start attacking you. Depending on whether or not there is a bell bearer nearby, they will start triggering a wider alarm that will bring even more enemy reinforcements to you, so it is possible to fight your way out of these situations quickly if there's not too many guards around. Sometimes it's pretty easy to get overwhelmed, though. Guards can also react to finding things as they shouldn't be, so if they find a dead guard's body, that will also set off an alarm. However, guards that are killed in an accident don't qualify for this, so environmental kills are a thing, you can knock over barrels, activate traps, that kind of stuff, and in that instance, the other guards who see that will go, oh, was just an accident. Now, where this gets really tricky, especially on higher difficulties, is that some of the islands, especially the later ones, are just loaded down with enemies, and your job is to take your three characters and steadily dismantle those defenses without being discovered, which becomes more and more difficult to do, especially when you start facing the enemies that are like Kindred and the Prognosticators. Kindred are connected to another enemy. Both of them have to die at the same time for the Kindred to die, otherwise they'll just revive after a short period. Prognosticators have to be hit twice, as the first time you attempt to kill them, they will actually stun the attacker, with you then having to take a second character and attack a prognosticator to actually kill them. Another option here is to hit them with environmental kills if available, which will also do the trick. So little things like that can throw a wrench in your plans alongside just dense enemy placement. But this runs into a few weak points that I already mentioned. Because the enemy placement on an island is the same no matter what mission you're doing, once you've figured out how to take down enemy defenses efficiently, that's pretty much it. You know how to do it every time you go to that island in the future now. And that lack of variation alongside the lack of enemy variety does, in my opinion, make the game feel a little stale a little too quickly. But another big part of combat is the quick saving. This is a game that very much so promotes save scumming. As I mentioned in the story section, it's literally part of the narrative. So anytime you're about to try something and you want to see how it unfolds, drop a quick save. The game will remind you at regular intervals to do this. And if it goes bad, you can just F8 back and try again. And because of that, even on the more difficult modes, you're pretty much free to try as much as you want. And you don't even have to load the previous quick save, the last one, you can pull up a menu and load back to basically any quick save you've made for that mission. So while things can get a little stale, especially if you're playing for longer periods of time like myself, it is a game that no matter what the difficulty is very much so fair, as you can quick save and reload at any time to try again, and with the enemy placements being pretty much static, you know what to expect. So if you make a mistake, it's pretty easy to learn from and keep trying until you find a way to do it better. So the game's not really stressful or anything, and a lot of it can be chalked up to trial and error, and thanks to all the different approaches and characters can be a lot of fun at the same time when you set something up and it works really well, which is usually done by activating the sort of pause mode where you can then issue individual commands to various party members. And when you use this to set up something particularly elaborate, it's a really satisfying feeling. And that, I think, is what Shadow Gambit here does best. It's a lot of fun, and thanks to some pretty forgiving mechanics, you can, through trial and error, learn to set up some really fantastic stuff. Because all of that mechanical information, combined with the more vibrant aesthetics that we have at play here that kind of just ooze charm, the game really does manage to be very, very fun. Which is certainly helped along by the 
the fact that everything I've just mentioned is very, very polished, which you've hopefully seen on screen up to this point, because all of those factors together are really what sell this game to me. The fact that we have all these colorful characters who have all these very elaborate abilities that can set up really satisfying moments to take down multiple enemies at once, and even when things fail and go sideways, sometimes even that's kind of fun to just see how stuff plays out for you. Because an alarm being triggered isn't necessarily the end of the world. Depending on the amount of enemies around, you could potentially fight your way out of it. So while the core gameplay is really evaluating enemies, patrols, placements, defenses, and figuring out ways to dismantle those from stealth, the moment-to-moment -moment of that, controlling each individual character, giving them commands and telling them who to attack when, and just the mechanics around the enemies in general, are all really, really polished, which contributes to a really fun experience even when things go very poorly for you. Because worst come to worst, you're always just another quick load away from another try at it. So if you take nothing else away from this part, the game is very fun. Now that does bring me to the Steam Deck section of the video, and I am happy to report that the Steam Deck version of this game runs incredibly well. It's got all the usual stuff you would want, we're talking cloud saves, full controller support, the game runs very well, I didn't have any issues on the technical side pretty much at all with the game really, but not even for the Steam Deck, and probably the biggest endorsement I could give you for this particular game on Steam Deck is this game feels better to play with a controller than it does a mouse and keyboard. And if you're familiar with my channel, that statement coming from me means quite a lot. I will absolutely play Souls Likes with a mouse and keyboard before I use a controller. This game, however, nailed the controller support. I was a little worried about how targeting would work, but even this seems to properly prioritize enemies based on proximity to you. It feels great to move around, it's easy to activate abilities and commands. So while the game technically has an unknown rating for the Steam Deck at the moment, I would be very surprised if it does not earn a verified rating. It was a very good experience for me there. And that brings us to our positives and negatives. Now my first positive for this game is simply that it is a lot of fun. Pretty much everything about this game is straightforward, it's got really great gameplay, and while the mechanics itself are simple, all of it pulls together to make a comprehensive experience that knows exactly what it's trying to do. I also really enjoy enjoy that after the story is over you can go back and complete all these challenges and everything and the game tells you kind of exactly what you're looking for so if you're looking to 100% this that's a great feature that also leads you to discovering some of the more obscure stuff that the developers hid in there as many of the islands have a lot of fun little secret things going on but another really big positive here is that the game is very much so polished normally especially with new games i talk about the technical state of said game at some point in this review but i saved it for here because I ran into one bug while I played this, and it only happened twice. Sometimes, when an alarm was supposed to end, it instead got stuck at zero, which across about 45-ish hours of gameplay only happened twice and it fixed itself with a quick load. Nonetheless though, I do have a couple of negatives, and for me it was pretty much enemy variety and the enemy setup. There's really only a handful of enemy types, you meet them all very very quickly and that's pretty much it. And then the placement of enemies on the islands is the same no matter what time of day or mission you're on. Which means that the game can kind of feel like it gets stale pretty quickly, even when you're just trying to do the story, like without even trying to do the 100% stuff. By the time I got to the end of the roughly 20-25 hour story, I was a little bummed out that the game just didn't have anything new to show me after the first few missions, beyond just more elaborate enemy defenses, so to speak. All of that, though, does bring us to our conclusion. My conclusion for Shadow Gambit The Cursed Crew is that this is a fantastic indie title that does does one thing very, very well, which is, of course, stealth strategy. I think this particular game shows just how much Me 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 Games has really refined their approach to this genre, as they made a few different games in this genre, and given the success of Desperados 3 and now this game, they've really, really nailed the gameplay of this in a way that's pretty remarkable. And because of that, I absolutely think the game is worth buying. However, I will say that the game itself is $40 in the US. I don't know what that amounts to regionally for everyone, of course. But while that might seem initially a little steep for a game like this, I would remind you that there is a demo available on Steam if you want to try it out for yourself first. But ultimately, the game was a 
a ton of fun. It was very polished. I ran into almost zero bugs. The Steam Deck version even ran great, all of which makes this game incredibly easy to recommend. So to reiterate, absolutely gets a buy from me. I think it's worth your time. But that is pretty much going to do it for this review. So if you liked the video, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. Let me know what you think about this particular game down in the comment section below. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. Yeah.